Well, good morning once again. Good to be here with you. My name is Clark, and I'm a pastor here. And if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I would love to meet you, and I'd love to meet your family after service. So feel free to stick around. You don't have to scurry off. You can stick around, talk to somebody, maybe meet somebody new. And uh, yeah, just encourage you to take me up on that. So the Cleveland Guardians are in the championship series. That's pretty cool. Even if you're not a sports fan, that's pretty cool. Especially in light of the OSU game yesterday. <laughs> and Oh my goodness, getting spit on? How did we ever get to that point? Well, we are uh, continuing in our sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And today, uh, we're going to be looking at the interceding spirit, which is going to be all about prayer. Right? We talked a lot about prayer in our small group here this morning, too. So um, if you were there for that, then this is going to be even more talk about prayer. But we're at church, so it would make sense that we would talk about prayer at church, right? It would be weird if we didn't. So if you're just now uh, jumping in, in with this uh, series on the Holy Spirit, we're uh, kind of on like week five or six now. So you can get caught up on our website, RitmanGrace.org and get all caught up with all the past week messages on the Holy Spirit. But we're going to talk about prayer a little bit this morning. Uh, all Christians, my guess this would probably agree, that prayer is vital. Prayer is important. Prayer is something that uh, we ought to be doing if we're followers of Jesus. Uh, if we're honest, I think we would also agree that prayer, for a lot of people, including myself, it can be incredibly frustrating at times. The reality is prayer is hard. In fact, one church surveyed people giving uh, various reasons as to why prayer was hard for them. So I want to share with you a list of reasons that people gave uh, from a church that surveyed uh, why people thought prayer was hard. One person said this uh, when asked why prayer is hard. Prayer is hard because it feels like a monologue, not a conversation. All right, so that's... That's kind of saying, like, you know, you don't really hear God's voice talk back to you audibly, right? Unless you're opening the Bible, of course. But in prayer, uh, it's not like in the days of Moses where you would audibly hear God talk back to you. So it can kind of feel like a monologue, right? Not a conversation. Another person said prayer is hard because it means admitting weakness, right? So you're depending on God when, when we're praying to God. It's about dependence, Another person said, prayer is hard because I doubt my own motives. I feel like my prayers may be selfish or self-centered, right? I could relate to that. You don't want to just ask God for things for ourselves. Sometimes that feels like our motives are not in the right place. Another person said, prayer is hard because I have a busy and distracted heart. None of us can relate to that. <laughs> Sometimes we get distracted when we pray. Another person said, prayer is hard because I'm afraid of the will of God. Maybe what I want is not what God wants, and I'm not sure that I'm okay with that. Hey, at least they're being honest. Another person said, prayer is hard because it doesn't feel productive. It doesn't feel like I'm accomplishing anything. You ever feel like that? Like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? One person said, uh, this is the last one I have, they said, prayer is hard because I don't feel like my prayers are good enough. I'm not sure how to pray, and I don't feel skilled and equipped in praying the right way. So all of us, my guess is all of us uh, who follow Jesus can probably resonate with some of these statements, can't we? At one time or another. All of us who have tried to pray can engage with the difficulty of prayer. Right? Maybe for some it comes natural to you, but for most people, my guess is it can be challenging. So it's challenging. So here is our challenge here this morning. As we talk about this topic of prayer in our series on the Holy Spirit, maybe part of the reason prayer is difficult, maybe it's because we're not praying in the Spirit. We've been looking for the past five or six weeks at the person the work, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so far, as I mentioned, we've uh, discussed quite a bit 
but just to recap a little bit, uh, the first week of this uh, series on the Holy Spirit, we talked about the idea of the awakening spirit and how the Holy Spirit, the way we see it outlined throughout Scripture, is that it can bring people from a place of uh, spiritual death to spiritual life. That's when you talk to people who are followers of Jesus, they might say something such as, I'm a, a, a born-again Christian. Right? We see that in John chapter 3 where Jesus says, you must be born again. And so that's the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Theologians would call that regeneration, where we are regenerated. God uh, works in our heart and, and makes us, goes from a place of being spiritually dead to spiritually alive again. And so the, the Spirit awakens us. Week two, we talked about this idea of the indwelling Spirit and how the Holy Spirit actually lives in us and dwells in us uh, from the time we're saved until the time we are taken home to be with Jesus in heaven. Week three, we talked about this idea of the mortifying spirit. You go, whoa, what is that word, mortifying? Mor to mortify means to, to put to death. And so we talked about how the Holy Spirit helps followers of Jesus in that battle against the flesh, the flesh being everything that comes with the fall. From Genesis 3, Adam and Eve. And so this idea of battling our sin, putting our sin to death, the Holy Spirit mortifies our, our sin. And so we talked about that. And then we talked about the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit uh, helps us. Uh, we cry out, Abba, Father, the Apostle Paul says. And so when we're saved, we become part of God's family as sons and daughters of God. We are adopted. The Holy Spirit also gives us hope. We talked about that last week and how uh, we have hope that our bodies will actually experience redemption, that we will get new glorified bodies in heaven with Jesus. Our hope, as I mentioned earlier uh, with communion, we're reminded our hope is not in this uh, temporary place, this, this earth that we're dwelling. Uh, we have hope for a future where we experience full redemption with Jesus in heaven. Those that have uh, come to know Christ through faith and repentance. So today, where are we? We are looking at this idea of the interceding spirit. The interceding spirit, in other words, how the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. How the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, and in chapter 6 of that letter, there's an interesting command, there's an interesting exhortation. He commands us, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. It's a pretty complex exhortation if you think about it. Uh, notice he says, so on all occasions, right? Always be faithful, not ceasing in prayer. But pray how? In the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says. You pray, but make sure you're doing it in the Holy Spirit, right? You might look at that and think, whatever that means, but that's what we're talking about today. The Holy Spirit is the key to effective prayer. We cannot pray the way that God commands us and the way that God instructs us to pray apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Well, Romans 8, once again, Romans chapter 8, gives us the answer. So if you have your Bible with you today, which I hope you do, I want to invite you to grab those, open them up to Romans uh, chapter 8. This is the chapter of the New Testament that we've been working our way through because it's just full of uh, theology of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to break in at verses 20, uh, 22. So verse 22, here's what the Apostle Paul has to say. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Verse 25, Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself, here's the word again, intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So today I want us to learn three things about Spirit-driven prayer, we'll call it. Three things about Spirit-driven prayer. If you're taking notes, here's the first point. Spirit-driven prayer is weak prayer. Spirit-driven prayer is weak prayer. What am I talking about? Well, let's look at verse 26 again. Paul says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for. He says the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In other words, one of the foundational things that we have to be okay with if we're going to experience the grace of the Holy Spirit in prayer is we have to admit that we're weak, right? That's a hard thing for us to do in today's culture. We have to humble ourselves and admit that we're weak. This is a given, Paul says. We don't know how to pray like we should, right? So that's ad admitting something. We don't know something. We're weak in something. To experience rich, deep, and effective prayer, we have to start by acknowledging our weakness. And here's why this is such good news. Because for most of us, it's our weakness that actually pushes us away from prayer. And so if we just think back to that list of things that we talked about at the beginning of our time together this morning... Right? The person that says, well, I don't pray because I doubt my own motives. Or the other person that says, well, I don't pray because I have a busy and a distracted heart. Right? You ever just look down at the floor and pray, and then you, you start to pray, and then you start thinking, like, wow, I should replace this carpet. Wow, what would it look like if I had wooden floor here? Next thing you know, you're, like, thinking about Home Depot and Home Improvement, and uh, you're like, whoa, what happened? I was just praying. That's our weakness, though. All those statements are just various ways of saying, I'm weak. Many of us would say, I don't know what to do in prayer because of those things. This text that we're looking at this morning in Romans chapter 8 is telling us the very opposite. All right? That's why it's good news. It's actually those things that ought to drive us to prayer. Spirit-driven prayer is weak prayer. It's prayer that acknowledges. It's prayer that admits, I don't know how to pray. I'm weak in prayer. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's good news. In other words, God is not put off by those things. Contrary to popular belief, the beginning of conviction of prayer is the conviction that God is our Father. And that like a good father, he's okay with weakness in his children. He doesn't expect us to get our act together before we come to him in prayer. Rather, he invites us to come to him in the midst of our weakness and in the midst of our frailty, in the midst of our distracted hearts. God welcomes us in our weakness so he isn't put off by our weakness. But on the contrary, Satan very much does not want you to pray. Satan does not want you to pray. Because prayer is very threatening to Satan and his kingdom. Satan will try to tempt us to despair in our weakness. Satan will suggest thoughts in your mind, such as the following. Man, you're really bad at prayer. I don't know how God can even listen to this rambling nonsense. Satan would suggest thoughts to your mind such as, God doesn't have time for your mental muddle. You'd be better off just to put away this and go on with your day. Listen, if you hear things like that when you pray, that is not the voice of God. That's the voice of your accuser. That's the voice of Satan who very much wants you not to pray. 
He very much wants you to feel like you have to perform and get your act together before you can come to God with your prayers. But God is not that way. God's not that way. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. So the first key to Spirit-driven prayer is recognizing that it's weak prayer. Prayer that begins by acknowledging weakness. Because we do not know how we ought to pray as we should, according to Paul. So we see spirit-driven prayer is weak prayer, but then secondly, what do we see? Spirit-driven prayer is dependent prayer. Spirit-driven prayer is dependent prayer. And we see this in our text in the middle of verse 26. Spirit-driven prayer is dependent prayer. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The first reality is merely acknowledging our weakness, but now he's saying, in light of the fact that we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. So the Spirit-driven prayer is a prayer that's dependent on, it's a prayer that relies on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us, Paul says, but what does that feel like? What does that look like? It's kind of like back in verse 16 of chapter 8, where Paul says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So two spirits mentioned here. You have the Holy Spirit, and then we have our spirit. And it says, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. In other words, there's something internal, something in our spirit that the Holy Spirit confirms and creates assurance that I really am a child of God. That something that's happening as the Spirit interacts with my spirit. Well, the same dynamic is true and at work in the Spirit interceding for us. In other words, it's not that I'm over here trying to pray and over in the next room is the Holy Spirit praying for me because he knows that I'm weak and can't do it very well, but rather, where does the Spirit dwell? Romans 8 tells us, in us. Spirit dwells in us. So the Spirit interceding for us means that the Holy Spirit that dwells in me, if I'm a Christian, is provoking and engaging prayers through my Spirit. What that feels like is this, the Holy Spirit is creating burdens. The Holy Spirit is creating burdens and longings and desires. Notice it says the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Some of your Bibles probably say with groanings too deep for words. This is angst. It's this longing. It's the exact same word that we saw last week when we talked about hope, and all creation is groaning in the pains of childbirth, and even we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. It's the same principle at work. It's that longing, it's that groaning, that burden of knowing that we live in a broken world. We live in a messed up world where there's accidents, there's hurricanes, there's something that's not right about this world that we live in. And yet it, it's still to experience this full redemption. And as I begin to, to hate the brokenness of this world and, and long for it to be restored in and through the Lord Jesus... That's what drives prayer. It's this longing, it's this groaning. The Spirit intercedes for us by interceding in us. The Spirit is provoking prayer within you. So instead of doubting your motives in prayer and wondering if the things that you pray about are really good things to pray about, here's what we need to learn to do. Identify the longings in, your, in our souls Identify the longings in our souls and ask, is this something that Scripture says that God would want? Is 
And if it is, then pray it. Express it to God. Ask Him, God, is this something that Scripture says that you would want? If it is, then we need to pray and express it to God. That's what it means to depend on the Spirit in prayer. We begin to look for, we begin to listen for what promptings and what longings is the Spirit awakening in my soul. Spirit-driven prayer is weak prayer. Spirit-driven prayer is dependent prayer. And then finally, we see that spirit-driven prayer is listening prayer. Spirit-driven prayer is listening prayer. Look at verse 27, and let's pay attention to the logic of this verse that Paul gives us. And he who searches our hearts, that's God, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. And how does he know? It's because of this thing we call the Trinity. Remember, we said everything you need to know about the Holy Spirit needs to be Trinitarian. In other words, how does God know the mind of the Spirit? Because we're talking about one God and three persons. There's this inner Trinitarian life and community that's at work. Paul continues, he says, He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Prayer is an invitation to join the internal conversation of the triune God. So what this text is telling us here this morning is, look, God the Father has a will. God the Father has purposes. He has things that he wants done in this world. And the Spirit who lives in you knows what the will of God is and how to pray in line with those things, in line with God's will and God's purposes for this world. And the Father knows the mind of the Spirit. He hears the prayers of the Spirit because of the community that's within the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this changes the way that we pray. Prayer is not us over here trying to figure out what God wants over here, hoping that we're praying things in line with that. Spirit-driven prayer is God purposing things, the Spirit knowing what God wants to do, and the Spirit awakening those longings within God's people so that we pray those things. Spirit-driven prayer is listening to what the Spirit wants what the Spirit desires, how the Spirit is urging us to pray in line with the will of God. Spirit-driven prayer is listening prayer. It requires us to be thoughtful. It requires us to be reflective and to be able to discern and pay attention to the internal voice of the Holy Spirit, to stop our chattering for a while, to listen and to ask God, what do you want done? What is your will? What is your purpose? What is your heart? And how do you please align and tune my heart to your heart? What does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? It means admitting your weakness, depending on the Holy Spirit, on the help of the Holy Spirit, and listening to the Holy Spirit. Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought because we're weak in prayer. And that is the stated reality of this text that we're looking at this morning. It's okay to say what the text says. And God does not resent nor despise our weakness. God does not send us into the other room to get our weakness figured out and then come back later to look better. What does God do? The Bible says God helps us in our weakness. He helps us by giving us the gracious gift of the Holy Spirit to help us to pray as we ought. And hopefully we can see God's grace in this text this morning, that he has given you the Holy Spirit to help you pray. What's required of you is that you persist in prayer. Persist in prayer long enough to feel your weakness, to know what it means to have to rely on the Spirit Because at that point, you come to the end of yourself. You realize you're weak. 
The problem is that with most of us, we don't persist long enough. We get frustrated. We get selfish. We listen to the lies that Satan might suggest. And then we just end up giving up altogether. And as a result, we never get to a place where we really know our weakness. We never get to a place where we feel our weakness and then begin to lean into the presence, lean into the power, lean into the life of the Holy Spirit. The lie that you and I believe is that someday we are just going to wake up and be good at prayer. The lie that you and I believe is that someday we're just going to wake up and be good at prayer. But that does not work in any area of life, does it? If I just wanted to wake up and be good at guitar, that'd be crazy. No, you have to, have, you have to persist in regular practice of scales and chords, bar chords, music theory, regular persistent, uh, uh, persisting in practice. That's how it works in every area of life. And so we're not just going to wake up and be good at prayer. We don't just become lovers of prayer and joyful in prayer and faithful in our pursuit of prayer by just waking up one day and magically being changed. We grow in prayer by praying. We grow in praying in the Spirit by praying. We learn how to be dependent and weak and listening in prayer by, you guessed it, praying. God is calling us to be a people who lean into, who trust the Holy Spirit and pray. We are called to be weak. We're called to be dependent. We're called to listen. For us to be a praying church, we need to be honest about our weakness. We need to depend on and rely on and listen to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, and we do we do not know what we ought to pray for, Paul says, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And so, Ritman Grace, let's continue to be a praying church. We've been a praying church, but I just want to remind us to continue to be a praying church. And what does that look like? It looks like being weak. It looks like being dependent. And it looks like listening. So let's close by praying that God would help us with these things. Well, Lord, there is something in us that doesn't want to admit that we're weak and that we're frail and that we're broken. But, Lord, we acknowledge in your word that weakness is actually the beginning of effective prayer. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would give us a longing to pray. Give us a longing to be a more faithful people. Help us not to walk out of here this morning feeling like we need to try harder. That is not the message we want to walk away with. Help us to walk out of here relying on, depending on the Holy Spirit to make us a people who are faithful in prayer. Help us to depend on your Spirit's strength. Make us a more prayerful church by your grace. And God, would you cause us to be a people who long more deeply for redemption in our lives and in our community. We pray these things for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.